In just a moment, X minus one. But first... You are listening to the distinctive style of Claude Thornhill, one of today's top musicians and band leaders. It's popular music with all the beauty of a classical symphony. And there are more fine arrangements by Claude Thornhill all this week when he makes his appearance on NBC Bandstand. In addition, you're treated to the inimitable beat and rhythm of master jazz man Lionel Hampton. Join MC's Burt Parks and Dick Hames all this week on NBC Bandstand. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X-5, 4, 3, 2, X-1, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight's story, The Snowball Effect, by Catherine McLean. I took over the university at the time of crisis. For one thing, we had been placed on probation by the conference for overpaying football players by 100%, and one half of the varsity was penalized a year's eligibility. On top of that... I was called in by Mr. Harvey J. Grover of the Board of Trustees. We had lunch at 21 on his expense account, and after the Napoleon brandy, he lowered the boom. Dr. Holloway, the university is in crisis. I know, Mr. Grover, I know, but I'm assured that our scouts have turned up several likely zinc miners in Colorado. You can assure the board that we'll have a line to reckon with next season. I'm not talking about football. There are other things at the university, I'm told. Well, of course, of course. Holloway, as president of the university, you've taken on a grave responsibility. Oh, I know, I know. I don't mind telling you the board has been gravely concerned. The number one problem facing us is academic freedom. It is? You're darn tooting. We want every academic department free from debt, running in the black. Is that clear? Academic freedom, huh? I see. Any faculty that can't support itself by grants, bequests... Corporation or government contracts is out. All of them? Down to the last assistant instructor. Look, Holloway, I'll, I'll put this to you straight. Most of the board was against hiring you. They had a bright young plant manager from General Products they said could show a profit from a candy store in the Mojave Desert. But I stood up for you. Why, thank you, sir. I told them the president of university has got to be at least a high school graduate or it doesn't look good. You know... You did graduate from high school, didn't you? Oh, yes, yes. And college, too. I got my master's at Harvard and my doctorate at... Oh, uh, never mind. Let's, let's not go too far. Have you got this straight now? Oh, yes, yes. I've got to make a profit on the candy store. I mean, the university. That's right. Oh, and uh, Holloway... Yes? How many zinc miners did you say uh, we dug up? I started in with anthropology, astronomy, astrophysics, agriculture... Almost all the departments could show a nice, healthy contract from the Department of Defense for research, or from some corporation. Even the classical wing came out okay. They were being subsidized by a pride of Texas millionaires who thought it was cute to have original Greek and Latin tombstones set in concrete on their patios. One fellow from Galveston gave a classical barbecue featuring a swimming pool with pornographic marbles from Pompeii set around the scum gutter. I ran into my first problem when I got to sociology. Now, look, Dr. Caswell, I'll be frank with you. I'm paid to make sure this institution doesn't come out on the short end of the stick. Well, that's a, a quaint expression. I got it from Mr. Grover of the Board of Trustees, so you can see this is no time for kidding ourselves. Can sociology pull its own weight? What is it? 
Sociology is the study of social institutions. Now look, Caswell, to the Board of Trustees, sociology sounds like socialism, and nothing can sound worse than that. Come on now, what are you doing that's worth anything? My dear sir... And don't wrinkle your nostrils at me, Caswell. If you have allergies, take an antihistamine. If not, just answer my question. This department's analysis of institutional accretion by the use of open system mathematics has been recognized as an outstanding and valuable contribution to... Valuable in what way? Well, since the Depression, Washington has been using sociological studies of employment, uh, labor, and standards of living as a basis for its general policies please, of... Please, please, Professor, stick to brass tacks and leave Washington out of this. What specifically has the work of this specific department done that would make it as worthy to receive money as, say, a heart research fund? Fundamental research doesn't show immediate effects, Dr. Holloway, but the value is recognized. As well. All the other departments have managed to squeak by. You're the last one. Unless you can toe the mark, there'll be 14 sociologists testing the institutional efficiency of unemployment insurance as an instrument of economic policy. <laughs> Well, knew I had him. Unless he could show me how his department could scratch a buck together, I'd have to expunge his name from the catalog and have him drummed out of the faculty club. I'll hand it to him, though. He glared from behind his front nails, and uh, sliding into his lecture manner, he started his column. Institutions, organizations, that is, have certain tendencies built into the way they happen to have been organized, which cause them to expand or contract without reference to the needs they were founded to serve. I have developed a form of uh, socio-mathematics to plot these factors. And by comparing formulae... Is it all perfectly clear to you? <laughs> well, it wasn't to me either. I grasped the idea that he could tell whether an organization would get bigger or smaller and why. And so I asked him for proof. Well, I, uh, I could give you a demonstration. How quickly? Uh, six months. All right, let's see. We've got a basketball team averaging seven feet. That ought to keep the board busy till spring. And after that, that bonus pitcher we stole from the Milwaukee Braves. Uh, all right, Caswell, you've got six months. I forgot about Caswell and sociology department for a couple of days while I went back to convincing semi-literate millionaires that they might as well leave a couple of millions to the university rather than have the federal snap it up in inheritance taxes. I was on to a real butte. A button manufacturer with a bad heart who could go any minute, who wanted to endow a scholarship for needy and intellectually gifted lacrosse players. When Caswell came back to see me, we had lunch at the student cafeteria on my expense account. And he explained, Ever hear of feedback effects? Is it something to do with reducing overweight co-eds? <laughs> no, no, it's a mathematical term. You might call it the snowball effect. You mean like rolling a snowball downhill? That's right. It grows. Now, here's the mathematical symbol. That spiral? That's the formula for the general growth process. Uh, do you understand the equation? Why, no. It accounts for all sorts of institutional growth. Uh, the Roman Empire, Alexander, the Masons, the uh, spread of tobacco, anything. You see, when the snowball becomes too heavy for the cohesion strength of snow, it, it breaks apart. Now, we've decided to run the test on an organization and make it grow according to the formula. I see. You're going to use some club or lodge or something as a guinea pig. If you could follow the equation, you'd see I've built a pattern of a, a cogent reason for the ins to drag in new members from the outs and an urgent factor to prevent anyone from resigning. That's this uh, Greek symbol here. Kappa for compulsion. I suggested a few changes in the organization plan, and we finally worked out a setup that was nice and simple. We put our heads closer together and tried to pick the best place for a demonstration. It should be small enough to observe, and yet large enough to be statistically significant. How about Passaic, New Jersey? My sister lives there. Oh, let's make it Watershaw. I have some student sociological surveys of it already. We can pick a suitable group from that. We've got to make this an ironclad demonstration. We'll have to pick some little two-foot nothing club that nobody would ever expect to grow. Some miserable, pathetic little organization. We found the perfect test guinea pig. The Watershaw Wednesday night sewing circle. Caswell and I drove over next Thursday night to a meeting. They always met Thursday night, except every once in a while when the chair lady forgot to have her hair set, in which case they met Friday. Well, I... Girls, girls, girls! Uh, ladies, girls, we can't 
business to conduct, girls. Helen, please. Oh, well... The regular meeting is now called to order. Bernice. Just a minute, dear. Will the secretary... Uh, Bernice. You're out of order, dear. Uh, it's not a regular meeting. But of course it is. It's Thursday, isn't it? I distinctly remember when we had that special meeting on Tuesday for Toby's baby shower. We adjourned sign or die when she started to have pain. Oh, my goodness, it was forced labor. That certainly doesn't count. But this meeting is just a continuation of the other one. Oh. How do you feel, Toby? Fine. A little out of breath. Did you try a little dry toast just before climbing the stairs? But, Bernice... My doctor said to breathe deeply through my nose and to have Henry tie my shoes for me. Well, I'd like to see Alfred tie anything for me. It's three years since I dared get a dress that zipped up the back. Madam Chairman, I rise to a point of order. Well, my goodness, Helen, you don't have to be a martyr about it. <laughs> That's the way the meeting of the Watershaw Sewing Circle went on. After a prolonged parliamentary battle, the point was finally carried that this was the tail end of a previously adjourned special meeting. At this point, the secretary, who had a shorthand training, read the minutes. It was moved by Harriet that a vote of confidence be registered in the administration of the club's business by Bernice. The motion was seconded by Elsie, who said she thought it was only fair because Bernice didn't even have an unlimited phone. And look at all the calls she had to make on club business. The motion was amended by Joan to include Bernice Calloway as well as Bernice Hackett. Because with two Bernices, the whole thing would be confusing. And it didn't seem fair to discriminate between Bernices. Because Bernice Calloway didn't have an unlimited phone either. And besides, her phone was way upstairs in the bedroom without even a kitchen extension. The motion was defeated because of the lack of a quorum. <laughs> Finally, the new business of the meeting was reached, and Bernice, um, what's her name, introduced Professor Caswell and myself as observing professors doing a survey of charitable institutions. After the business meeting, brownies, sponge cake, and apricot uh, peekaboo cookies were served with coffee. And Caswell and I drew the unlimited Bernice aside. You see, Mrs. Hackett, I've been making a few notes on a slightly modified constitution and bylaws for your organization. You have? You see, it all depends on having a competent and capable lady in charge. Oh, yes. Yes, frankly, I see. Frankly, this plan would be dangerous unless there was a woman of great character elected to the post of chair lady. Well, of course. You see, there are several ways of, well, influencing an election. Oh. That's why it's important that only the right people fully understand this. Oh, you're right. Absolutely. Why, the organization was just floundering before the last election. Now, uh, can I see those plans, Professor? They sound like they're just what we need. Naturally, she was hooked. As Caswell buttered her up, her eyes began to gleam, and she studied the simple little bylaws and constitution the professor had drawn up, nodding happily as the classic beauty of the scheme struck home. The meeting broke up when after four brownies and a wedge of butterscotch cashew angel food surprise, Toby started to have real labor pains. We found out later it was a nine-and-a-half-pound boy. Caswell and I left the meeting and stopped for a pizza and beer to get the taste of the apricot peekaboo cookies out of our mouths. Well, there you are, Dr. Holloway. They adopted our bylaws with only one dissenting vote. I don't like that secretary. She's a spoiler. Always suspicious. My first wife was like that. Don't worry. She hasn't got a chance. That Bernice woman has clear sailing under my equations. It's rigged to favor an aggressive extrovert over the paranoidal personality. You're sure it'll work now? I'd stake my academic reputation on it. You have. Don't worry, Dr. Holloway. We've given that sewing circle more growth drives than the Roman Empire. We let the whole thing gel for a while. About four months later, I shook loose from my schedule and dropped over to see Caswell. He looked up from a student paper on the correlation of Bermuda shorts seen at Madison Avenue and 46th Street to the swing towards Democratic candidates in the Corn Belt. Ah, good morning, Dr. Holloway. Uh, good morning. Caswell, I just wanted you to know we hadn't forgotten you. Now, about that sewing club business, I'm beginning to feel the suspense. Could I get an advance uh, report on how it's coming? Well, I haven't been following it that closely. We're supposed to let it run the full six months and then check. Uh, but I'm curious. Could I get in touch with that woman? Uh, what's her name? Bernice something? Uh, Hackett. Uh, Bernice Hackett. Would it change the results if we checked it now? Not in the slightest. If you want to graph the membership rise, it should be going up in a long curve. 
probably uh, doubling ever so often. Well, if it's not rising, you're fired, you know. If it's not rising, you won't have to fire me. I'll burn my books and shoot myself. I went back to my office and put in a call to Watershaw. Mrs. Hackett wasn't in. The maid informed me she was at the meeting. That sounded better. If the sewing circle was meeting on a Saturday, then maybe Caswell had a chance. But she wasn't going to a sewing circle meeting. There was another organization, the Civic Welfare League. I hung up the phone and thought about poor Caswell. If the sewing circle had really gone up the flue, he was on his way up with it. I decided to go over to Watershaw and check to give the poor old goat the benefit of the doubt. The meeting of the Welfare League was in the Knights of Columbus building, a tremendous pile used for dozens of club meetings at a time. There was some kind of political rally going on in the main hall. Streets were jammed, and I figured I was going to have a tough time finding the little back room where the Civic Welfare League was meeting. I figured they must be in a pretty bad way trying to hold a meeting in competition with a brawl like the one in the main room. Uh, right this way, uh, look, sir. Miss, I'm looking for a small meeting. Well, it's here you are. Uh, membership application, song sheet, bylaws, and pledge. No, no, you don't understand. I, I don't well, want to. Well, that's all right. You can keep it. It's a new membership kit. Everyone's supposed to have it. We've just printed up 6,000 copies to make sure there'll be enough for this meeting. No, you, you don't understand, miss. I'm looking for the meeting of the Civic Welfare League. Well, this is it. No, no, no. I mean the one with Mrs. Hackett. Bernice Hackett. <gasps> Do you know her? Well, there she is up on the speaker's platform. And now, after the ushers have passed among you with membership blanks, it is time to rededicate ourselves to the principles we stand for. With a bright and glowing future, the best people in the best planned town in the country, the jewel of the United States. All we need is more members. Now get out there and recruit! 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 Yeah! I cornered Bernice Hackett at the speaker's table. She had a clear, sparkling look to her eye, and she was dressed in a trim gray suit with a towering feather on a small hat. A clutch of pretty junior ushers, all with goose pimples showing above strapless formals, clustered about her. I managed to get to see her in the back room while the mayor was addressing the meeting. Well, hello there. It's a pleasure to see you. What happened to the sewing circle? Oh, it's just a little change, that's all. Helen, dear. Yes, B.H. Send those wires out to the senator in Washington. You can tell him we want his support on the slum clearance or else. Check. And now let's see, where were we? Oh, yes. We started growing by amalgamating with other small charity groups. Worked much more efficiently that way. Bernice, we're running out of membership blanks. Call the printer. He's got instructions to keep the type standing. Check. Naturally, we had to change our name each time. But we've still got the same constitution and bylaws, uh, the ones you professors worked out for us. Then you've been growing. Oh, dear, yes. Uh, Bernice. What do we do about the town board of aldermen? I explained to them they can't get in at a group rate. Each one will have to join separately. Check. Oh, yes, Professor. We're growing and growing and growing. I kept close watch on the sewing of the Civic Welfare League for the rest of the month. Evidently, they'd swallowed up the real estate organization because they came out with a plan to attract new industries to town, and there was a gimmick splitting up the profits among club members only. It was the same provision Caswell built in to split up profits from dues and fines, but now it was operating in the hundred thousand. I graphed the rise in membership, and it went up like the first rise in a roller coaster. I went over to Caswell's office to tell him the good news. Naturally, I knew the equations would work. Well, don't be so calm about it. With a demonstration like this, I can get all kinds of grants and funds for the sociology department. You'll think it's snowing money. Well, naturally, I expected this. I haven't been following the test at all, but I was quite confident. I don't mind admitting I wasn't. Well, that organization sure blew up. Now, let's see the formula for stopping it. Oh, I didn't complicate the organization with negatives. I, I wanted it to grow. It falls apart naturally when it stops growing for more than two months. You remember we built into it the idea that the members know what happens if the membership stops growing. Why, if I tried to stop it now, they'd cut my throat. Yeah, yeah, they sure were enthusiastic at that meeting. No, we'll just let it play out to the end of its tether and die of old age. And when will that be? Well, it can't grow past the female population of the town. There are only so many women in Watershaw, and some of them don't like sewing. Sewing? Sewing? Caswell! Well, what's the matter? Uh, are you sick? 
You haven't been following the experiment? Why, no. I, I told you I haven't even thought about it since we started. Well, they wanted to expand, and they weren't going to let sewing stand in their way. They went from general charity to social welfare schemes to something that's pretty close to an incorporated government. They're now filing an application to change their name to the Civic Property Pool and Social Dividend Membership Combine. Well, well, very interesting. I hadn't thought of that. Fascinating. Dr. Caswell, tell me, where? Where does the formula say it will stop? Oh, I shouldn't worry. It stops when you run out of people to join it. After all, there are only so many people in Watershaw. It's a pretty small town. Yes, yes, it is. Doctor, they've opened a branch office in New York. Caswell got out his slide rule then, and we went over the charts I had been keeping. He ran the results through the physics department's new analog computer to check the results. Mm Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, yes, it, it checks. Well... Well, now, allowing a certain lag of contagion from one nation to another, uh, language and cultural barriers, you know, it will reach total world population in 12 years. About one week after that, uh, various isolated pockets, uh, Australian bushmen, Tibetans, African pygmies, will all be members. You mean only 12 years? Give or take a week, 12 years. The whole world? Well, there is something to be said for a worldwide government. Uh, Many people are definitely in favor of it. But under Bernice Hackett, the whole world? Oh, you asked me for a demonstration. The equation works. But what happens when the whole world is organized and there are no new members? Well, two months after the organization stops growing, it collapses. It's built in the formula. Yes, but what happens then? Oh, well, I haven't the faintest idea. I haven't carried the equations that far. Look, Caswell, whatever happens, I don't want anyone to ever pin this on me. From now on, if anyone asks me, I never heard of Watershaw. Well, that was 12 years ago. I think Caswell and I are about the only men on Earth who don't hold membership cards in the United Terrestrial Civic Welfare and International Property Pool. Bernice Hackett, Global Administrator. It's a race against time now. There hasn't been a new member in a week and a half, and Bernice is anxiously awaiting news from the first Mars expeditionary fleet. And as she says, if only they find life there. We need new members, desperately. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Stars, My Destination the first installment of a four-part serial by Alfred Bester, a brilliant novel on teleportation in the world of the future. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Snowball Effect, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Catherine McLean and adapted for radio by Ernest Kinoy. Featured in the cast were Ted Osborne, Wendell Holmes, Warren Parker, Audrey Blum, Mary Patton, Patsy O'Shea, and Peggy Allenby, your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Thousands of hearts are being saved today, and many persons with heart disease are learning how to live happier and more useful lives. The fact is, most heart patients can keep on working often at the same job. This progress is the result of intensive medical research, research which you support when you give to the Heart Fund. Send a contribution now to your local heart association or to heart care of your post office. When you help your heart fund, you help your heart. Only NBC Radio brings you the whole convention.